Um, and this is some uh, old time stuff on this fundamentals test one from chapters one to three. The first self-propelled vehicle that used an auto cycle four-stroke gasoline engine was introduced when? 1885. 1885, that's how that thing. Now, uh, Jessica, did you get a good handle on that four-stroke cycle when you were watching that video the other day? Pretty well got that down pat. You understand that really well? All right, let's... Uh, Look, okay. early vehicles were constructed mostly of what material? Yep. Wood. As a matter of fact, the old Model T Fords, whenever the dealership ordered a Model T Ford, the crate oh. that the car was shipped in was supposed to be disassembled and they and it was cut so that you it was the floorboard. That's why they call a floorboard of a car a floorboard because it used to be boards, it used to be wood. Um, uh, which component is not a part of the chassis system? It's actually the electrical system. The chassis has got to do with the brakes. Now think about this. When you're pulling diagnostic trouble codes and you get a C code, you know, and your, your, your anti-lock brakes are going to give you a chassis code, like a C whatever, you know. All right. Now then... Um, what component regulates the temperature of the coolant in an engine? That's exactly right. Nothing wrong with that. Easy answer. What company produced the first large-scale affordable passenger car? Oldsmobile. Oldsmobile. Believe it or not. Um, you know, when David Buick first came to here from Germany, you know what his uh, primary skill was? Making bathtubs. He knew how to make he knew how to make ceramic and cast iron stick together, and he was making bathtubs. And somebody had laughingly said one time, "That's why the old Buicks look like upside down bathtubs." You know, so, um, I don't know if that's the truth. What U.S. manufacturer produced the first vehicle with four-wheel anti-lock brakes? That's a good question, isn't it? Four-wheel anti-lock brakes. Lincoln, believe it or not, Lincoln did that. Huh. Yeah. Uh, which pillar is the nearest to the front of the vehicle? Everybody understand the pillars on a vehicle? Watch this, just for in case somebody doesn't know. This is a car. We're going to draw a station wagon. All right. We're going to do it this way. A pillar, B pillar, C pillar, D pillar. Got it? What is this area called? That's the belt line, believe it or not. Right at the base of the windows going around. This fuzzy stuff in the uh, where the windows go up, that's called a flocked run. <laughs> There's all kinds of names of weird stuff that you would never think about, you know. Uh, all right, let's go here again. Um, let me see. Uh, so A is no uh, the A pillar is which is going to be it's going to be D, but it's A pillar. Okay. Oh, I put those are all jacked out of shape. They should have put A is A and B is B. Technician A says full frame vehicles combine the body of the vehicle with the frame structure. Technician B says unibody vehicles combine the body of the vehicle with the frame structure. You know we talk if you've done that worksheet on that you know about the unibody plus the full frame vehicle. Um, so, which one of those guys is correct? Do full frame vehicles combine the body of the vehicle with the frame structure? No, they do not. You got this frame that looks like a big ladder and the body of the car is bolted on it on rubber mounts. That's a full frame vehicle like a pickup or an SUV. Have you noticed that since Crown Victorias have gone away, most of the police cars now are SUVs? They're heavily going toward SUVs because they need full-frame vehicles for police work. Those chargers are cool looking, but they just don't have the durability of a full-frame vehicle for doing police work. You know, so they using you see them using a heck of a lot of SUVs nowadays. Uh, the old Chevy Caprices used to have full frames under them, and so did you know the Crown Victorias do. Um, yeah, but um. Let's see. Uh, technician, B. technician B is correct on that. In what year was the automatic transmission introduced in passenger vehicles? 
That was in 1940, believe it or not. And uh, this next question, you're going to have to, huh? Yeah, you're going <laughs> to you're going to have to say what component is this technician holding? And that is a that is a plum silly uh, question right here. I guess it's just for you know whatever. Okay, now then, ooh, I drew this and there's already a picture on the back. Which one of these is commonly called the B pillar? C. What did he say? C. Is that Charlie Delta Baker? What? C. <laughs> Look at that. That's crazy, isn't it? That is a confusing question, isn't it? C. C is one because I got them all messed up. If I was drawing that, I would have put them in the right order, but that would have messed you up and told you the answer, wouldn't it? So they mixed them all around. So it is C. Number 12, the average age of a passenger car on the road today is over what? Nine years old, over nine years old. There are 250 vehicles in this country for every service bay in the country. I heard that at a convention I went to, a training convention. Uh, I went in to one of these places where they, you know, they have you this, you ever been, in, I don't know, in these uh, conventions and all, they'll have a little, uh, every place will have a little plate and they'll have a little thing of jello here and then they'll give you some kind of an entree and you'll have a little, you know, tall highball glass of water and all that junk. But the guy that did the speaking at that was, he said, he gave that statistic, he said, uh, 250 vehicles for every service bay in the country. That means if you've got one service bay you're working out of, you've got 250 potential customers. Most shops are going to have you working out of two service bays if it's any decent sized shop. So that means you've got 500 potential customers. That'd keep you busy all year long, wouldn't it? All right. But, and where are they going to go? They're going to come to you if they like your work, right? Um, vehicles built today are in service longer than vehicles built 20 years ago. That is absolutely true. In the 1930s, if you got 10,000 miles out of an engine before you had to rebuild it, you were doing good. In the 1960s, and I grew up in the 60s, if you got 100,000 miles out of a car, that was a mighty fine car. But now then, in the 90s, you'll see cars like that white uh, uh, Pontiac sitting out there that I got, for instance. It's got 250,000 miles on it and runs like a sewing machine. You know, fuel injection is better because you don't have to tinker with a carburetor and all that hard one. Yep. Hey, come on in here, girl. Do you want to do some uh, work study for me? Can, can you do typing and filing and all that kind of stuff? Nope. Huh? Nope. You can, can't you? Yeah. Well, let's make it happen. What, what, what day, when can you work? Any day you need me to. Um, I mean, uh, when are your, what do your welding classes look like? I only have to do three hours a day. And I'm there at 7 o'clock in the morning. Okay. Well, you can work up to uh, 12 hours a week, mm -hmm. and that'll help you with that. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and sign this right here. Well, most of the time during the week, I have to leave here about 2.30. That's fine. Work at 4. That works. That that's works for me. Right. Y'all be nice to her because she's going to be putting your grades in. Ain't that right? Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. The deal's done. All right, thanks, when are you going to be here first? I'll have to teach you how to do the stuff. Tomorrow. All right, I'll see you tomorrow. What time? Tomorrow, Wednesday. What time? I don't know. I won't be here tomorrow until 1, but that's fine. You can come in at 1. After that, I mean, every other day I'm here normal. You can come in on Friday if you want to. I'm here until 11 on Friday. If you don't want to come in Friday, that's okay, too. Okay. So, all right, I'll see you tomorrow. And then, or it might be Wednesday because I have to fill all this out. i got to leave early tomorrow. That's fine. All right. All right. All right. All right. Uh, huh? She decided that she her uh, uh, accounting class was too hard, and she was going to have to ramp up her study time. Uh, she even told uh, Randy that she liked working with me, but she said that I've got so much study, and I'm going to have to do. She said this is going to kill me. She said I'm going to have to study instead of doing work study. You know so. But uh, anyway, um, let me ask you this here. Uh, independent service facilities often provide in-service training for their technicians. That's actually a B, but that's not true in every city. You know what I mean? 
uh, in Texas and uh, New York and California and places like that, and like Kansas, you know, when I go to that uh, uh, KC Vision thing, uh, the Automotive Service Providers of Kansas has actually got a big uh, training expo that they do that people come to from all over the world. Um, I don't know if there is a, a organization like that in Alabama, but anyway, uh, but in your bigger states, you know, that are really busy, there's a lot of training that's offered. But you know, it, it's not free. You know, it's going to cost you. Um, number fifteen, a resume should be how many pages long? Just one page. Um, the problem I have with my resume is I got to use a really small font because it goes back a long way. Right? What personal information should not be included on the resume? Age. Age. Now, typically, I guess they figure if you're old enough to work, you'll be filling out a resume. Uh, number 17, why is having a good driving record important for the shop? Well, it lowers insurance costs, but I will tell you there are some people that I've uh, seen that if you had a a nasty ticket on your driving record, the insurance would tell the shop that they couldn't hire you. <laughs> you know what I mean? So keep your driving record clean if you want to do that. Also, it's a good idea not to use marijuana or drugs of any kind because most all of them have you take a drug test nowadays. You know what I mean? I don't think anybody in here has got that problem. But um, let's see. Uh, also, make sure when you drive somebody's car, Another thing I like to say when I'm talking about driving somebody's car is whenever I get used to get in somebody's car, if there was any possible way I could safely drive that car without moving the seat, I will. If I have to move the seat, I will. Um, but the uh, radio doesn't need to be playing. I need to, I turn it, unless I'm working on it, I turn it off. I'm not going to dial it to my favorite station. I'm going to turn it off, okay? You don't want to hear the radio. You're there to work on the car and not be entertained. Also, you don't jack around with the stuff that's in their console or their glove box. Leave that stuff alone. Unless you have to remove the console to do work, which we used to have to sometimes to work on the I mean the uh, airbag module or to put a cable in there for the shift interlock, we'd have to take the console out. There's screws in the bottom of the console. You know, don't disturb their stuff and as much as you can put it back like you found it. That's sometimes kind of hard because when people load their glove boxes, they've thrown the stuff in there a piece at a time and it's had time to settle. And then whenever you take the stuff out of the glove box, unless you're really careful, you can't ever get it back in there like they had it. You know what I mean? Um, we don't typically see any uh, contraband material in these vehicles around here. But if somebody's got something in their vehicle, uh, don't be tempted to take their change because sometimes, I mean, I have seen people get fired for taking change out of people's cars. Even if they got a bucket full of quarters in there and they're probably not going to miss one, leave their dadgum stuff alone. I mean, I've actually known of people getting fired for stealing change out of people's car. Uh, it was all, you know what always tempted me was when they had a 16 pack of Juicy Fruit in there, you know? But I'd say, this person could be a really fastidious person and if I took one piece, they may know I took it. And then they'll think I'm a, a jerk. So I left their stuff alone, you know what I mean? But I was never tempted to take anything else, but I did sometimes want a piece of gum. But I would usually just quell that urge, you know. Um, really, furthermore, it ain't right to take their gum. Even if they're, if they're standing there and they say, hey, you want a piece of gum, go ahead and take it. Yeah, but don't, you know, don't take it. Uh, all right, now then, uh, during an interview, what are you supposed to do? These are soft skills. You're supposed to show enthusiasm, state your willingness to work, explain your work experience, or all of these. If they do like they did with uh, Daniel, that one boy that I graduated a couple of semesters ago, and they slide a wiring schematic across there and they want you to read it, you better be ready. Don't do the ooh, 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 ooh. If you do that, you're not going to get hired. I mean, that was that was going to be a, a – he, if he didn't give the right answers, he wasn't going to get hired there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Daniel Kelly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, because you were here when he was there before. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. But uh, yeah, he's working over there. I know. He, I think they put that new piece of a shop out there, and he's working at the new part of the shop. If I'm not mistaken. I think so. I don't know they add on again. Yeah, yeah, that's a busy, that's a busy dealership over there. They really crank out a lot of work. Yep. Um, 
anyway, uh, let me see. A beginning service technician earns $400 a week. How much should the technician spend on a vehicle payment? Four hundred a month shouldn't be any more than a fourth of your disposable pay. You know, what a successful automotive technician possesses soft skills such as effective communication. That's true. Everybody knows what soft skills are. Uh, let me go so far as to say that eighty-five percent of the people that fail in their careers fail because they can't get along with people. You may be a really good person at doing what you do, but if you can't get along with people and you don't communicate well. There's going to be some issues there. Um, I was uh, on the soft skills part of it, and incidentally, I'm supposed to include soft skills as a part of what I'm teaching y'all. But I like to tell that story about this guy that had a uh, Power Stroke diesel, and it, it was also a stick. And he was grousing because when you took off, it would go, hum, 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 hum. you know, it wouldn't take off smooth. It would, it would sort of, you know, hop when you take off. And I didn't even work on the doggone thing. I didn't even work on it. But somebody else worked on it. And so the problem was, it was kind of in the, in the part of the year when it gets dark kind of early. But the porter that went out there to bring it in wasn't all that great at driving a stick. And so he brings it around, and when he's pulling it up outside the ride-up area, it goes bump, bump, bump. <laughs> and the guy thought it wasn't fixed because of what he saw that do, but he didn't know the guy wasn't great at driving a stick. It was a perfect storm. The guy was thinking, my truck's not fixed before he even drove it. And he was railing on the people in the ride up area. Well, that, typically whenever that happened, my soft skills were always better than just about everybody else's. I don't know why. I mean, I, I kind of like talking to people, you know. And so they would come and get me. They says, can you come out here and calm this guy down? Because he's mad as a hatter and we don't want him talking to the guy that worked on the truck, you know, because the guy that worked on the truck was kind of a hothead. And so I says, yeah, I'll go out there and talk to him. So I went out there and I got in the truck and I let him chew on my ear for about while we drove around the mall down there. He was going, rawr, 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 rawr. you know, he just, just grousing about everything. He was in a bad mood and all that. So when he expended all of that energy and he ran out of everything that he had to grouse and complain about, he then noticed that when I took off, it was not doing that because <laughs> I know how to drive a stick, right? And I told him at the end of his tirade, I says, you know, I sent a VCR off to North American Phillips and they kept that thing up there a year and charged me $100. When I got it back, it still wasn't fixed. That's what I'm talking about, he says. But he said, it seems like it's doing okay. I'll let y'all know if I have any more trouble with it. I said, that's good. <laughs> Just let him event, you know. And then he realized, well, the truck's fixed, you know. So he actually went off half cocked and sort of, but I just let him carry on, you know. There's no use in, and here's something else I want to say too. Even if you're better, let me say, this is a little thing I posted the other day on Facebook. Whatever you decide to do in life, strive to be legendary. You want people talking about you afterwards and say, that was a good mechanic. That was a good whatever. That was a great guy. We would love to have this one back, you know. Be legendary when you're trying to do something. And the better you are at the work, let's say that you, you turn out to be legendary. It doesn't give you a license to be a jerk just because you happen to know the more than the guy in the next service bay. Be nice to everybody because it don't cost nothing. Right? That's a quote from Bear Bryant, you know. All right. Now I'm going to start this next one.